Okay, so I'm actually quite excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, enlightenment. Uh, for me, and this isn't true of everybody, um, but for me, enlightenment as a goal was a, was a really important um, apple in my early practice years, that's early to mid, um, because I found having that kind of clear aim and finding the stories of folks who could share their enlightenment experiences or their experience of enlightened living, um, I found that really inspiring. And I say found in the past tense because um, I think part of the process of evolving enlightenment is at some point you realize it's all a hoax, you know, or as my teacher Kenneth Folk said, it's the great cosmic joke. Um, it's like, oh yeah, here you are. And so it, 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 thus it has always been. You know, we've always been right here, but in the past we were looking for something and that's seeking enlightenment. And now we're here, that's enlightenment. So if you're just here and that becomes your home you know, being here, then it's not a big deal anymore. You can just be, and you, and you don't even get to be claiming there's anything special about that. That's the, <laughs> there's a disappointment with enlightenment as well. Um, oh, I thought it was going to, I thought I was going to be some like superhero, like Spider-Man or, you know, I thought I was going to be like Phoenix rising from the ashes with levitation powers and psychic. Well, maybe some of those come for some people, some of the time, but mostly <laughs> I've noticed people just become more like who they are, more like themselves. And, um, that's been the way it has been for myself and for the teachers that I've worked with that I really respect and my peers, my friends who've been on this path. And I've seen it with students that I've worked with too over the last 10, 11 years. seems like it's just part of the game, just waking up to the fact that what we're seeking for is already here. But you can also see that in the, in the history of the Buddhist tradition, the understanding itself of what enlightenment is has changed. Um, and so that's interesting. That's something worth noting. And here I'm going to use the model of the three turnings, which comes from the, uh, um, the Tibetan tradition primarily where I learned it. And it's an understanding of this sort of three iterations of the evolution of Buddhism, that Buddhism itself, as it developed, it developed into a particular form. And then over hundreds of years, that form began to change and new teachings emerged and new ideas that were very fundamentally different than the earliest um, paradigm the first so-called turning of Buddhism. And in this first turning, this is what's traditionally called the Sutra Yana school. Yana means um, body or vehicle. And Sutra here is just a reference to the teachings of the Buddha. Um, if you ever see something that's called a Sutra, that just means it's teachings from the Buddha. So the Sutra Yana is the vehicle of the Buddha's teachings, the original vehicle of the Buddha's teachings. Um, and in that original corpus of teachings, which started around 500 BC, went through, yeah, it's still alive today in certain modern forms, Southeast Asia, but uh, to about 200 CE, this was the dominant form, um, Sutrayana. There was a particular ideal that everyone was uh, trying to get to. In, uh, I don't want to say everyone, maybe some people went off the beaten track. Um, but a lot of people were trying to achieve this goal within the Buddhist context of becoming a fully enlightened person, uh, what in the tradition is called the arhat or the arhant, depending on which ancient language you're using to translate the term. And the arhat is the fully enlightened one, is a, someone who's realized the teachings of the Buddha uh, and who's come to the end of suffering for him or herself or their self. They've seen through a certain kind of suffering described in the Buddhist teachings on the four noble truths. You know, the first noble truth, there is suffering. There is unsatisfactoriness. Life is unsatisfactory. It's impossible to completely escape uh, the unpleasant and the, uh, the unwanted. Uh, and so we suffer um, because we're always kind of in some kind of battle with that. We want it to be otherwise. Uh, and we seek for better conditions. And sometimes we get them, in which case we're happy for a little bit until then we get dissatisfied with that. Uh, or um, this is the original teachings, as they said. Um, 
or we don't, we don't get what we want. And then we're really upset. <laughs> um, and, and this is kind of the way it is being a human being, you know, we're born, um, we grow old, we face illness. So we see our loved ones experiencing difficulty and then eventually we pass away. And, and it's not to say there's not all kinds of joy and beauty and love in, in between all that. It's just to say, like, you, even no matter how beautiful and joyful and loving it is, you can't escape the reality of birth, old age, illness, and death. You know, these are the things that are part of being a, a conditional being. Uh, and so, but there is something, according to this early Buddhist teaching, you can do. You can become free amidst the changing conditions of life. You can see the comings and goings of things and not hold on, not fixate. Um, you can be free amidst even tremendous discomfort or pain uh, and still be some part of you, some deep part of you, be untouched. And this was described as the realization of nirvana, of the unconditioned, the unborn, the unmanifest, that which has never come into the stream of time, has never been born, will never age, and can never die. And um, one who has realized the unconditioned fully and completely, we'd call the arhat, fully enlightened one. They've come to the end of their own suffering and the end of rebirth, the end of having to continue to slog on infinitely in this suffering game. <laughs> That's, this is the first turning. This is how it's described. Um, and it's said of the arhat traditionally that the arhat has released what are called 10 different fetters, 10 different things that hold them, um, that keep them stuck uh, suffering, that keep them stuck in conditioned, uh, believing that they are something that's conditioned and thus um, experiencing the suffering of being a conditioned being. Um, and some of these fetters, um, they're said to release progressively as one gets more and more enlightened. So the, the sutrayana, this early path of Buddhism is really focused on a gradual kind of enlightenment. You know, it's a, it's a gradual path. It develops over time. Um, sometimes it can come quite quickly for some, like Bahia in the story of Bahia Sutta, you know, where he goes to the Buddha, talks to him and says, hey, I really need, I need you to tell me what the deal is. And, and the Buddha's on his way to get food. And he said, no, Bahia, I can't right now. I got him trying to get some food. And Bahia continues to ask him to please teach him. He's come from so far. He wants to get the uh, teachings that'll help him wake up. And the Buddha says, okay, fine, Bahia, like real quick. In the seeing, it's just the seen. In the hearing, just the heard. And the cognizing, just the cognized. Once you get that, you'll be awake. And Bahia, being a really, I don't know, lucky guy, he gets it. Like he was prepared. He had done some practices. And he woke up right there on the spot, according to the tradition, according to legend. Uh, and, and we see even modern legends like this. Eckhart Tolle is an example. There's many people. Suzanne Siegel, in her book, Collision with the Infinite, describes a total sudden awakening while getting onto a, a bus in London. Just boom, almost no preparatory training. Bam, her ego's gone and doesn't come back. Um, these kind of stories are ancient and contemporary that we have people who suddenly will wake up to this truth all, all at once. But usually for most of us, it's a gradual path. We can't, uh, we don't make the turn that quickly. We just open so slowly one, one thing at a time. And, and we gradually let go of these fetters, these, um, these, these fetters of becoming, as they're called, which include a belief in a permanent self. Um, so eventually we let go of a belief in a permanent self. They include doubt and uncertainty, especially with respect to, to the awakening that's described. Uh, they, they include attachment to rites and ritual, rituals, holding on to the idea that certain rites or rituals, including meditation, will get us there, including the ritual of meditation. Uh, letting go of sensual desire, ill will, lust for material existence and for the immaterial, subtle states of consciousness. Um, those are all let go of, it's said by the Arhat, that they let go of conceit. So that's self-referencing, always worrying about oneself, 
restlessness and ignorance both are said to go for the arhat to be completely extinguished. So the arhat has let go of all of these, these fetters and just rests in the unconditioned as the unconditioned. Okay. That's my best description of the arhat that I could give. Uh, pretty cool, right? Above and beyond it all. Um, but there's a, a turning, a next turning in the wheel uh, that describes a shift in, our, in, our, in relationship to enlightenment and the goal. And this is known as the Mahayana tradition. Maha is great yana vehicle, the great vehicle. Contrasted with the earlier one, which wasn't as great, apparently. <laughs> it's all marketing too. Uh, and here, there's a, there's a legitimate shift though. It's not just marketing, uh, although there's that. Um, but there's also a shift in the philosophy. And I think we've talked about this um, with the, t- the two wings practice. This emphasis on compassion starts to center stage. It's not just the egoless wisdom seeing through everything and letting everything be and resting in this transcendent super space that's not, not really a space and not really anywhere. Um, but realizing actually that transcendence isn't separate from what's happening. Nirvana is samsara. Samsara is nirvana. These are the words of Nagarjuna, the second century um, philosopher, Buddhist philosopher. And his teachings and his approach become the bedrock or the foundation of the second turning. And you hear it expressed in an important Mahayana text, the Heart Sutra, form is emptiness emptiness is form form is no other than emptiness emptiness no other than form seeing is empty hearing is empty smelling tasting touching thinking are all empty forms and these forms are no other than emptiness there's this non-duality at the heart of the Mahayana tradition, a recognition that you can't separate out nirvana, the formless, the unconditioned, the unborn from form. Um, that actually they're, they're two sides of the same reality, the two truths. There's the universal truth and the personal truth. Or as my teacher, Jack Kornfield said, you've got to remember your Buddha nature and your zip code, both when you're functioning as a human being, you know, you can't, um, you can't forget the details because then it's hard to function. Um, and, and we see here the emergence of a new ideal of enlightenment in the second turning, which is the Bodhisattva being a Bodhisattva and the Buddha, uh, the original historical Buddha was said to be a Bodhisattva. You know, we have this record of all these past lives that are handed down in what are called the Jataka tales uh, of all these different existences that the Buddha was said to have lived on his, on his like super long journey to Buddhahood, to becoming fully awake um, and fully skillful in that wakefulness. And um, the Bodhisattva is the being who commits to taking the Bodhisattva vow. And here I'll share the vow that I've taken uh, as, a, as a Bodhisattva practitioner. This is, gives you a flavor for what it can sound like. There are many versions of this. From now until attaining enlightenment, I vow to work for the welfare of all. From now until attaining enlightenment, I offer my whole life as a gift to suffering beings. From now until attaining enlightenment, I will cultivate and, rejoy- and rejoice in doing so the path and practice of the Bodhisattva, developing the paramitas, the immeasurables, and so on. Suffering beings are innumerable. I vow to save them all. So this is one version of the Bodhisattva vow. Um, and, the, and the basic spirit here is like, I'm going to put my enlightenment aside. Instead of being all about me and my freedom, I'm going to focus on helping others first. That's really what it comes down to. It's a shift in mentality. Um, it's like the shift to being a parent. You know, you just realize, oh yeah, like it's not just about me now. I've got to take care of this little being first. Um, and, and why do I do this? Because I see I'm not separate from everyone else anyway. 
that helping other people is an expression of enlightenment. It's not separate from enlightenment. Um, everything is arising interdependently, co-arising with the Bodhisattva. It's all connected. You see the truth of that as a Bodhisattva. And, in, and, and it's said as, as the Bodhisattva perfects their skillful means over time through many lives in the Buddhist traditional context, um, that eventually they get to a point where they've perfected their wisdom. You know, they've perfected their compassion. They've perfected their skillful means. And, they, uh, and, and one is said to, to become a Buddha. And this is described as the ideal in the third turning, the Tantrayana traditions, Tantra. I'm sure you've all heard this term um, before. Um, it's often, it can have different meanings, but here it's a, it's, a, it's a meaning that relates to working with practices that flip the whole dichotomy of early Buddhism on their head. You know, instead of seeing all of these hindrances or obstacles to awakening, seeing the process of purifying, being getting rid of the things that keep us, the 10 fetters, freeing ourselves from the fetters, freeing ourselves from impurity, freeing ourselves from suffering. Here we see suffering as the path itself, you know, that actually we can turn toward ignorance and delusion and aggression and violence and, you know, and craving and grasping and wanting. And we can see all of that as the path itself. It's all the fuel of awakening. Uh, and it's an expression of awakening, as we learned in the second turning. It's emptiness itself. So we can turn toward, in a very transgressive way, the world of form, and we can use it. Every part of it can be part of our path, uh, including our own stupidity, you know, <laughs> and our own delusion. Um, and for the Buddha, it's all part of the path. Um, and the Buddha, again, it's, it's this ideal perfected enlightenment that we've, we've imagined if you had such a deep understanding of the causes of suffering that, and such a deep understanding of the interconnection of all things that whoever stood in front of you could instantly understand exactly what they needed to be free just for that, that person. And you could give them a teaching that would help them. You know, imagine that you had that level of competency and skill and knowledge and understanding, that would be like something approximating a Buddha. Um, and so um, through each of these three turnings, the, the ideal of what enlightenment is changes. And in the third turning, it's possible. It, it becomes a, a large part of the conversation that you could become a Buddha in this very lifetime. If you really do, do the hard, you know, do the hard work and, and, and trust, um, and it could be possible to remember your true nature and just to live into that completely. 